So my name is Pete Lucas, and tonight's webinar focuses on pediatric orthopedics here at University Orthopedics. We're joined by a great group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons from University Orthopedics, Hasbro Children's Hospital, and the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. Dr. Jonathan Schiller is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in trauma and pediatric orthopedics. Dr. Schiller specializes in fracture care, limb deformity, limb lengthening, scoliosis, and adolescent and young and adult young adult hip problems. Also with us is pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Cruz, fellowship trained with a focus on traumatic injuries, fracture care, pediatric and adolescent sports related conditions. And Dr. Craig Everson, chief of the division of pediatric orthopedic surgery at Hasbro Children's Hospital. Dr. Everson is fellowship trained in the treatment of scoliosis and other spinal disorders in children. So uh, we will talk for uh, about an hour and we welcome any questions. It's a free flowing uh, dialogue here. So if you're on with us, go ahead and send in your questions and we will do our best to answer everything. Unfortunately, we have had some questions that have come in uh, the days leading up. So we'll get through all of those and anything else we have. So uh, Dr. Everson, we will start with you. Uh, University Orthopedics is more than 45 specialty trained orthopedic surgeons. Uh, you are part of a group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons and each one of you specializes in your own focus area. Talk about why that is so important in the treatment of patients. Well, you know, over time, uh, you know, medicine has evolved where there really is such super specialization, it, it's kind of hard to, to do everything. And, you know, what we're seeing with kids nowadays, uh, you know, the treatments and, and uh, things that we have available to us are just uh, on the same par that they are for adults. And, and it, you know, in order to make sure that we're giving each condition or each child the best possible care, uh, you know, it, it's really important to be taken care of by a team. You know, the way we divide our, our division, uh, you know, we all, we all see, you know, just about everything uh, primarily, but we all have an area uh, where we have special expertise. Uh, we all do fracture care. We all do special needs children. You know, Dr. Cruz is, you know, one of the few in New England who does pediatric uh, uh, sports medicine uh, reconstructions. Dr. Schiller is one of the few in New England uh, that does some of the complex hip reconstructions. Uh, and I do some of the some of the complex spine reconstruction. So so we we take care of the whole team together. Um, but it's also important, you know, as we're all parents, we're all busy, and we want to be there and available. So having a staff of, you know, we have our orthopedic urgent care, we have two pediatric nurse practitioners, making sure that when your child gets hurt and you need to see an orthopedist, you can call and be seen right away is also important. So we don't only take care of complicated things; we take care of the little broken wrists. And you know, my, all of our children, well, actually, Dr. Schiller and my children. Uh, have been patients of our practice so far, and Dr. Cruz's little guy is not far behind, as is your son. So uh, I think that, you know, we love taking care of happy, healthy kids, you know, with simple fractures, and we, we, we love taking care of kids with complex problems, too. And uh, Dr. Schiller, Dr. Everson mentioned uh, the limb lengthening. For those who don't know, please explain it, and you're one of the only surgeons in the Northeast that uh, focuses on this type of surgery. Uh, what is it, and, and uh, how is it treated? Um, so typically, uh, limb lengthening, limb deformity <clears throat> involves either, obviously, as it says, you know, a, a lower extremity that's shorter um, relative to the other side, or if there is significant angular deformity or rotational deformity. And so uh, that um, type of uh, specialized area in pediatric orthopedics really just involves looking at those children and then deciding what needs to be done that can involve something like just cutting the bone and, and redirecting it, uh, or derotating it to make it uh, go in a better direction like the other side or lengthening it so that we can uh, get it to catch up to the other side. Sometimes that involves just shutting the other side down at the appropriate time based on uh, the child's age or in some cases those those differences are so large that we actually have to lengthen the bone and that can be done in, in a various uh, number of ways. What we like to do and what I kind of prefer to do is um, use a rod that goes inside the bone so that children don't have to deal with these large uh, frames, kind of like uh, some of the parents might, uh, might remember when they were kids, erector sets, lots of pins and wires and um, and these screws and they hold the frame on around the limb and then allow it to uh, lengthen. So um, there's a number of ways to deal with it. It's just, you know, it's tailored to each individual patient. And uh, we've seen a couple, we've profiled them with videos. Uh, 
some of the results can can really be amazing uh getting back to dancing and to gymnastics uh talk about oh, the sure. return oh yeah absolutely and you know kids that really had trouble walking because half their you know uh let's just say their leg is shorter than the other side to get them out to a, a an even length they can walk normally they don't have to be, have big lifts on the bottom of their shoe it it is life altering uh and the long term benefits both physically and mentally are is enormous you can't can't quantify and, and dr cruz uh the title holder for the inaugural university orthopedics 5k we have to bring that up here uh you're also the we're the captain of your track and cross country team in college so we know where your sports back Brown came from, but uh, tell us about your, your specialty in sports and how it applies to pediatrics. I think we have you muted there. All right, there you go. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks for the shout out, Pete. So hopefully we can do the 5K again you know, sometime soon once uh, things settle down. But yeah, uh, you know, sports medicine um, is extremely um, interesting. You know, obviously, a lot of our kids come in with sports injuries, uh, whether that be broken bones or torn ligaments. Um, you know, my background is, you know, after my training, I, I spent uh, three years in the Air Force where I, I, all I essentially did was treat sports injuries. So that's kind of where I came from. And then you know, I did some further training uh, in pediatric orthopedics uh, with a focus of sports. So. Um, uh, you know, I'm very interested and obviously, you know, kids, kids are going to play sports and, you know, the sports, the youth participation rate in sports has been uh, increasing uh, on a yearly basis for the past, you know, a decade or two. And uh, I would say uh, all three of us, I think mo a lot of our acute injuries are, are because kids are, are doing sports. So there definitely uh, is a need um, and there's definitely uh, people out there that are even kids uh, that are, are still uh, hurting themselves. Uh, maybe it's a little bit less right now just because there aren't any organized sports, but things are, at least in you know, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, things are starting to open up. So I think we're going to start expecting uh, these injuries to come back in. Dr. Emerson, yeah. what have we seen over the last few months? Things have changed. Families have kind of been on lockdown and kids have been, ki kids are kids, but are, are injuries a little bit different than what you've seen in a, in a typical spring and summer? Yeah, you know, it's really amazing. Um, you know, we talk all the time about overuse injuries, and it, it sounds like we're just saying that, but when sports went away, all the injuries go away, you know, and, and, and there are kids who now uh, will do telehealth visits, and, you know, you know, we made the appointment, and her knee or his knee was killing him, but, you know, he really hasn't had any sports for a few months. It feels better again, uh, and I think a lot of parents actually are, are, are buying into that, and I think even a lot of kids it's nice, you know, when you can walk around all day when you're 12 years old and not have both your knees hurt you constantly. And, and I think they're realizing that. Um, so what we're seeing now is, you know, the results, uh, and I'll tell you, it's the same in my, my house, of three cooped up children who just, you know, uh, jumping off of furniture, uh, you know, we certainly see a lot of that. And, um, and the kids are so eager, particularly for sports like baseball. We're seeing a lot of kids with sore arms because they go out and they have one week before practice, you know, to practice or two weeks and then they're, they're not really taking the time like they usually do to build up, uh, you know, in a, in a smart way. And, and the same is really true with soccer. They go out, they're sprinting, they're running, and they don't really have any sort of base training because uh, they've been cooped up inside. So it's kind of switched from, you know, the kind of overdoing it, chronic wear and tear, to doing it too quickly and uh, not building up properly. And Dr. Schiller, what, uh, what's the advice? For the kids out there, a lot of sports, uh, they started at Bass last week. We're looking at uh, Rhode Island Little League. I know my kids starting up next week. What, uh, what advice do you have for them? Well, I mean, I, I think it's you know, certainly in the hot, we'll start off with the general non-orthopedic stuff. You know, it's hot, humid, stay hydrated. You know, that's the first thing. I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. Um, I would say uh, equally as important as stretching and, and really kind of getting warmed up. Uh, it's, that's a no brainer too. Those are the two basic things. <clears throat> I would, I would um, add that you, you should probably work up to it as Dr. Everson said, you know, they haven't been doing anything really athletic uh, oriented for the last three, four months. And so to think you're going to go out there if you were running routinely say three, four miles a day, unless you're Dr. Cruz, uh, you know, you're not going to run right back out there and start doing it. You need to train 
and, and you know, same with throwing and, and whatever it is. So I think, you know, you should have a, a realistic expectation that when you haven't done anything, whether it's dancing, running, throwing, et cetera, you need to warm up to it, get slowly into it, and then, you know, move forward from there. Kids that are just being active that aren't being athletic, let's just say it's not organized sports, you know, they're just going to go out and bike rides, for example. Uh, you wear your helmet. That's, you know, that's a no-brainer. Skateboards, wear your helmet. Uh, I always kid in the office that we can put you back together if you fall and you break bones, but our, our best colleagues can't put your brain back in if it's out on the sidewalk when you're not wearing your helmet. So I know that's extreme, but that's the truth. And and so, you know, do the very, at the very least, wear your helmet. Uh, you don't, you know, wrist guards, et cetera. Uh, that's your call, but save your noggin. You, 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 can't, you can't fix that. Great, great advice. Uh, Dr. Cruz, I'm sure uh, there's been a bit of a fear to come in and, to an office setting and, and see a doctor. Have, what would be some telltale signs of maybe injuries that have occurred over the last few weeks or months where maybe a parent was, was hesitant to come in, but they should? And then uh, on top of that, how have things changed at University Orthopedics as far as being safe and some of the things that you're able to do now? That's a great question. So, you know, uh, mild strains and sprains, um, things that kind of improve with just a little bit of time, rest, ice, you know, in a day, uh, probably something that, you know, don't necessarily need to come in. You know, you'll see your kid jump off a bounce or, you know, trampoline and sprain their ankle. And then, but then, you know, 20 minutes later, they're, they're running around again. Okay. That's, that's uh, clearly not something that we need to, to bring in, but you know, something that where the kid doesn't improve overnight, say, or they have significant swelling or, uh, uh, for example, a knee injury that has a lot of swelling, something that you uh, are just wouldn't expect after kind of your normal bump and bruise. That's something that maybe to give our office a call. Uh, something that doesn't, again, doesn't improve the next day or something where there's a gross deformity <laughs> of a limb. Uh, you know, we have some uh, some recent cases where a girl, you know, broke her wrist and uh, mom didn't want to take her in, but it was clearly deformed and she finally brought her in about a week later and ended up needing to actually, you know, go to the ER for, for uh, you know, for appropriate treatment. So, you know, things like that or anything that where the kid can't, uh, you know, your son or, or daughter can't bear weight on the limb the next day, that's another reason to, uh, you know, to come in for an evaluation. You know, and University of Phoenix has been, we've been very good. I mean, every single person that comes into the, you know, all of our sites uh, gets screened. There's a very strict screening protocol. Um, so uh, every single person that has, has a screening, they get a sticker that they've been cleared. If there's any question that they're uh, not safe to be in the building, they get turned away, um, you know, to come back another day. We're limiting, uh, so with pediatrics in particular, it's very, you know, it's a kind of a special population. Obviously, the, a, a four-year-old can't drive themselves to University of Phoenix, so uh, uh, they're, they're with a parent or a guardian, but we're trying to, we're limiting parents and guardians uh, to just one uh, parent or guardian. Now, there are, you know, special circumstances where if uh, they have a sibling that, you know, doesn't have um, uh, child care at home, uh, then uh, clearly, uh, you know, that that's going to be okay. Uh, so don't be afraid if you have more than one child to, to bring your family in. You know, we'll make an exception. But in general, uh, we're trying to limit uh, limit the number of visitors that, that uh, accompany your child. But uh, we are taking all the precautions and uh, we're following all the state guidelines uh, to the T. So, and I think uh, when you you know when you come into our buildings, you'll see that it's it's uh, it is a welcoming and warm and friendly environment. And you know we we feel at least I feel very comfortable as does the staff uh, coming in, you know, every day to treat these patients. And uh, Dr. Everson, how about this, this foreign idea of telemedicine, what, four months ago, all of a sudden became a reality in a few days. Uh, you just spoke about how you've gotten used to uh, getting on your computer, talking to patients. How has that been? And, and discuss that option maybe for someone who might not understand how it applies to an orthopedic injury. Well, you know, I, telemedicine is fantastic. And, and so we found, uh, we found a few uh, really great, you know, uh, creative, uh, you know, re uh, outlets for this. So for one example is patients are worried about waiting, uh, you know, in a crowded waiting room or, or a crowded office, and they're coming for, say, for a scoliosis six-month check, and they get an x-ray, right? So they were coming in, and they're getting their x-rays and going home. And then I can pull up uh, the x-ray on my computer. I can share my screen with them. I can review the x-ray with them uh, directly and make changes or decisions based on that. Um, 
parents are pretty slick, especially the younger parents, younger than I am, and they know how to use technology. If their child is limping or walking funny, I have a lot of special needs children, and parents will say, "Can, can I show the camera and show you? You know, see what I'm looking at here. This is swollen, or, or is there is there walking change?" So really, when we were really in the thick of the COVID and no one was coming in, you know, we were able to get a lot done. Now I think there are things, for example, kids who need their range of motion checked after a fracture, right? And, you know, they can go in front of the camera and say, make your arm straight, make your arm bent, you know, and, and that saves them a, a trip to the doctor, you know, uh, going over an MRI, you know, the old days, either I would call you and try to explain it to you and, 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 and try to draw a picture of, you know, explanation and you'd have no idea what I was talking about, you know, or you'd have to come in just for a visit just to talk about an MRI. Now we can put the MRI on the screen. We can look at it together. We can use our cursor to point. And, you know, a picture is really worth a thousand words. So, so I think that there's probably a whole other set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, things that we can do. Uh, and it's just only starting. So we really, uh, I think it's been a fantastic addition to our practice. Great. And, and Dr. Schiller, I know you've gotten familiar with it. Uh, how do you use it? And maybe what are some of the things that really can't be used for where you tell a patient you have to come in to, to, for you to take a look at, put your hands on them? Um, I would say, you know, certainly my post-op patients, uh, I like to see them in the office. I just prefer, it's easier to ask, you know, answer the questions, especially in the immediate post-op period. Uh, I think telemedicine, as Dr. Everson explained, is great for simple, just routine checks. How are things going? Is PT okay? I think it's great for reviewing imaging studies. So an MRI read you want to get, they didn't want to come in, they're a little nervous, that's okay too. And so I think that's, that's where I've used it. Uh, like Dr. Everson, I take care of a great deal of, of special needs children. And it, as he said, it is a, it's, a, it's tedious to bring you know, very involved children in. Um, it requires a major effort. And so to just answer a question over the phone and or tell, you know, through the telemedicine, even if you have to refill, you know, do a prescription for braces, it just gives us an opportunity just to see them and then we can handle a lot of their needs just over the, over the computer. Great. Um, and we welcome any questions, anyone watching uh, either via Facebook or Zoom to go ahead and, and send them in. And we just got a question that, that popped in uh, about spine. So Dr. Everson will give this one to you. Um, it's a parent with an eight-year-old that has a small curve and a bit of arthritis. At what point does a child get treatment for the curve? Um, oh, that's a great question. Um, not sure about the arthritis. That's it's exceedingly rare in uh, in children. Uh, there are there is systemic arthritis, you know, which is different. But but you know, uh, in general, uh, you know, uh, when we're just talking about a scoliosis. Um, it really depends on how large the curve is, uh, and you know, the curves are measured in degrees. And usually, you know, the first step is getting an X-ray, and usually, a, you know, a primary care physician will order an X-ray, and the, you know, pediatric radiologist will will read it. Um, and if the curve is large enough where we word it's going to get worse, one of the things that makes it really uh, grow quickly is if the patient has a lot of growing to do. So for an eight-year-old child, you know, it might, might, you know, it just a lot of times we get asked, you know, at, from the pediatric level, what should get referred, what should be followed. I think kids under 10 with, with a curvature that's over 10 degrees should be seen by a, by a pediatric orthopedist because those are the curves that have the potential to get really big really quickly. And there's a lot of things we can do with bracing and scoliosis therapies and things that can really prevent that from getting worse. You know, for, for a smaller curve, uh, it really is, you know, particularly under 10 degrees, that's something that can be monitored. And, you know, most pediatricians feel very comfortable just following that, you know, on a, on a, on a yearly basis. Great. Um, and we opened this, uh, some of the questions up to pediatricians. Um, you, you communicate with many of them as well. Um, uh, referring patients over or answering questions. Um, so we made, made sure we wanted to answer some of these. So Dr. Cruz, I'll, I'll ask a specific question for the, the timetable on a return in sport for a young kid with a type three or type four post-op supracondylar fracture. Specific question for you, but you're, you're the guy to answer it. So just a little back, a super, a super condylar fracture, it's a fracture in the elbow, kind of, uh, you know, right, right here. It's the most common uh, upper extremity fracture that we operate on. So a typical mechanism is gonna be a kid playing monkey bars or you know, tripping and falling and falling onto their hand outstretched. And, you know, these are the ones that we, you know, we have at least one of these a day, pretty much. 
um, especially in the summer when things are uh, kids are being active. So the good news is that these these fractures uh, they they can uh, you know while they can be you know painful and, and traumatizing and, and uh, scary, um, you know the outcomes after treating them appropriately um, uh, are very good. So for the most part, kids are going to be in a cast. You know, they if they get surgery, they'll be in a cast for three to four weeks. Um, we see that you know, they'll be seen in the office to take the cast off at about three to four weeks, and then. Uh, you know, their, their fracture is usually healed enough where we can start letting them actually move the arm um, out of the cast. We put them in the splints typically for another uh, three to four weeks. So that's about six to eight weeks. And then usually at about six to eight weeks, they're out of the splint. Uh, their elbow is still a little bit stiff, uh, but their fracture is pretty much healed when we get the x-rays. Um, usually uh, in my hands, I don't tell them to go, you know, go play football at six to eight weeks, but um, you know, I'll let them kind of doing, start doing uh, more and more things that call ground level play. So they can, they can kind of you know, play outside, but not necessarily climb, you know, playground equipment or monkey bars. And then usually at around three months, uh, they're healed enough and their range of motion and strength is back to the point where they were before surgery, where they're, you know, they're going to be good to go for sports. So uh, long answer to a quick question. Usually after that type of injury, about three, three months or so before they're, they're kind of back. Great. And another uh, question that came in, and, and uh, Dr. Schiller, I'll, I'll ask you this one and, and to explain uh, the uh, terminology in this. What uh, are your criteria for surgical intervention in an adolescent with FIA and hip pain? So um, just for the terminology, uh, FAI is femoral acetabular impingement, which just simply refers to the hip where uh, the hip is we'll just simply called a ball and socket. And impingement just refers to a conflict between the ball while it sits in the socket. Typically, as you hip, uh, your hip flexes and rotates internally and maybe slides toward the midline of your body, so what we call adduction. And um, usually it hurts sort of in the front and on the side of your hip. We call uh, what we say the C sign distribution. So if you take the letter C and you put it right over the front of your hip, that's typically where it hurts. And when you have this, it usually will do some damage to the lining of your joint called cartilage. And in the hip specifically, there's a little ring of tissue, which I tell our Rhode Islanders, uh, most of which know what calamari looks like. And that little calamari ring, if you cut it, looks like a horseshoe, and that's what your labrum looks like. And that often is also beat up when you have impingement. And so, Typically, I manage that non-operatively at first with therapy, conservative treatment, activity modification, um, and then reassess the patient about eight weeks. Anecdotally, about half the people improve and have less pain, and I think at that point, you really just, the symptoms are better, but um, whatever damage is done to the labrum or the changes on the bone, they're not going to heal. They're not going to get better, but they just don't bother the patient, so that's okay. The other half typically don't get really better with their pain. Their motion might be better. A lot of the uh, uh, strength may improve, but they still have pain. And with those patients, I usually will order an MRI at that point. And then based on that, <clears throat> maybe possibly an injection in the joint with some numbing medicine, because I don't like steroid. I don't really think it really helps. And literature kind of shows it's not that great in the hip anyway. Um, adding all that up, so their history, their exam, the x-ray findings, and an MRI, plus minus a, an, injection, an injection of some numbing medicine. I look at all of that and then make a decision whether or not uh, arthroscopic treatment is, is helpful. And, and so usually there's at least eight weeks of non-operative conservative management before I even consider surgery. And, and that's really in general because... Um, it's not really a limb threatening problem. And I really want patients to feel that they're making a decision to have surgery based on their own symptoms and how bad they feel. And I find that if they're feeling bad enough that they really want to head down the surgical path, then it's usually, you know, probably a good idea seeing as that they failed their conservative treatment. And, and that's what we usually do. So we'll use a scope, look in there through little incisions, and then through that scope, we can put the tools in to look around, identify bad, identify good, fix and or clean up the good, and then try to make their hip look a little bit more like a normal hip. Great, and uh, Dr. Everson, on to you. 
uh, Dr. Schiller mentioned the non-operative approach. Um, can you explain that just because someone's coming to see you doesn't mean they're, they're having surgery with you, um, which can be kind of a, a misconception? Sure, and just in general, um, you know, the vast majority of things we treat uh, can be done non-operatively in children. And so, you know, if we're talking about scoliosis, for example, you know, for every, I don't know, let's say I see, you know, a hundred kids, you know, uh, I might brace 10 of them, right? And I might operate on one of them, you know, it's, it's really, but, you know, it's, it's understanding which kids have to be watched closely and, you know, which kids should be followed and which kids should be re-x-rayed and which kids should have other treatments. Uh, you know, that's kind of the, the art part of it, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the nuance. But fortunately, you know, pediatricians, uh, you know, check the kids pretty, pretty thoroughly. And, and it's rare to see something slip through that net, that safety net. And, and so the kids we're seeing a lot of times were referred and, and they're thinking about the horror story because their uncle had back surgery when they were, he was 50. And, uh, but really their child just maybe needs an x-ray in a year. Um, and the same is with fractures, you know, a broken wrist in an adult more often than not is an operation. A broken wrist in a kid almost overwhelmingly is a cast, usually waterproof, and then they're swimming in the summer. So, so I think most things in children can be handled you know, non-operatively. Um, but for the rare cases that do need surgery, and this is kind of really where, where, we, where we kind of specialize, you know, I mean, it's trying to figure out which kid really needs surgery, uh, and that's, that's the hardest part, right? And so, so that's where the kind of expertise comes in. Great. You know, that brings up a point, uh, Dr. Cruz, about physical therapy. So physical therapy can be an option for, for non-operative, or if they go to surgery, uh, they go through physical therapy. And I, I think um, the fact that you work so closely as a team with the physical therapists here, whether you walk upstairs and talk to them, uh, can you talk about how important their role is in uh, your patient care? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say a majority of the uh, problems that we all see, especially like overuse injuries, sports injuries, you know, majority of them can be treated without surgery. You know, it's a very small minority of our patients that, that actually do need surgery. And oftentimes the, the first line of treatment is going to be physical therapy. And uh, this is for both non-operative conditions as well as operative conditions. You know, for non-operative conditions, all it might take is just a little bit of stretching, a little bit of a, you know, a strengthening and conditioning program, a little bit of rest in conjunction with our physical therapists uh, and then you know, get these kids better and back to doing what they like to do. Uh, for post-op patients, you know, physical therapy is key. Um, you know, we can do a great operation, but if they don't have a good rehab plan, um, you know, the results of that operation are just not, aren't, aren't gonna be as good as having a good physical therapist. You know, and at, uh, over at you know, University of Orthopedics, you know, we work uh, very closely with physical therapists. Just for example, at our Kettle Point office in East Providence, you know, we're on the same floor. I routinely, um, the physical therapist will routinely come over to our, you know, just walk over uh, across the building and just ask questions or, you know, bring the patient over or we'll go over to the physical therapy pod and just uh, see how the patient's doing and, you know, kind of troubleshoot any problems or you know, answer any questions that they might have. So, you know, uh, we get to know each other very well and, you know, and the patient ideally will get to know their physical therapist very well. And honestly, they, they're going to see the physical therapist if they have surgery way more than they see us. So. Um, and we have a we have a great staff uh, at, at at UOI that we all kind of rely on. Um, so yeah, that's uh, physical therapy is, is is part and parcel with with what we do. Dr. Schiller, I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that. We we uh, did a video with a young lady who you took care of, and she had years of physical therapy. Had a graduation party on her, her last day of physical therapy in East Greenwich. Um, Talk about that, uh, the, the trust you place in, in this, this person, like Dr. Cruz said, who works, who sees this patient uh, more than you do on, on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in therapy. I, I, I routinely use therapy for even non-operative fractures in the lower extremities, um, except in really little kids. And that's, I think, uh, in part because, you know, uh, you take a kid out of a cast and uh, they tend to walk a little funny and um, maybe it's just self-preservation <clears throat> because I don't want phone calls about why the kid's not walking right and they're limping after their fracture sort of healing. Uh, but in general, I, I think the therapists get them on the right path. And in the end, uh, they tend to answer a lot of questions about what the kid is doing um, that we would normally have to answer and they get it and they're doing it and they get the kids better. And, and Dr. Cruz is hundred percent spot on that um, 
we can do the best operation. Dr. Everson can make the spine look like an arrow. Dr. Cruz puts in an ACL that's, uh, you know, like Tom Brady, you know, that'd be, be a quarterback. And, you know, I can do whatever osteotomy of the round the knee. The bottom line is, is that if you don't have the therapist working with you and really getting them back to where they need to be, it doesn't really matter what we do if they're not going to function that well. And, and in the end, uh, kids tend to heal most of the time. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we like doing this because they do heal pretty well. Uh, but they have to rehab and that's really what parents want to see is how does my child function after their injury or after their surgery? So I, I, have, I work intimately with them and I love, you know, sending kids to therapy. So it's, it's really helpful. Great. And Dr. Everson, I have to hear your thoughts on this too. I know it's a big part of uh, your practice as well. Sure. You know, um, I, I would echo everything Dr. Schiller said, you know, one, one thing that's been exciting for us is, you know, the role of therapy in, in, uh, in scoliosis. And, you know, uh, there's something called trough therapy, and it's a very uh, scoliosis-specific therapy, it tries to teach the patient how to utilize different muscles uh, that counteract uh, the scoliosis. And, you know, it, it really has taken hold in this country for years. And, you know, occasionally patients would ask about it, and really, no one, there was not a huge interest, but there's been an enormous interest. And so I had one of our therapists trained, and, uh, you know, within six months, his practice was full. Uh, and so we had a second therapist trained. And, and what we're finding is, particularly with the kids who um, uh, they can see the scoliosis externally, so it bothers them, they're very motivated. Uh, and we find that kids who do therapy do better with bracing and do better with treatments. Um, even though scoliosis, we're always taught, is not painful, if you really ask a lot of patients with scoliosis, they, they'll tell you they have some pain. And that's where I think therapy has been phenomenal. You have this child that has an x-ray finding that they can't see externally, they just know that their back hurts. Uh, or their hips are uneven, and and therapy has been phenomenal. Uh, you know, it's a very special kind of personality uh, that provides that kind of therapy. It's very one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on. In fact, one of our therapists, you know, he he was furloughed during the um, the COVID uh, uh, you know crisis uh, when it's at its peak, and he was on his own, uh, continuing uh, kind of a virtual, just keeping in touch with the kids, making sure they kept doing their exercises, making sure they followed through. And every kid who's come back in and told me how great it was. But for him, he just, did the, you know, that's what they do. Uh, and it's a phenomenal thing. And, and so, you know, it's very, you know, very rare can you be a surgeon and exist in a vacuum with, and, and the therapist is really the ones that make us look, look much better. Great. And, um, Speaking of uh, scoliosis, we talked uh, kind of in our preview call just about some of the things parents can do at this, at this point when, when their kids are maybe at the beach, uh, at the pool, and they've got their shirt off. What would a, a quick minute look like? You know, we've seen them in grade school where you bend over and you check your back. What would your advice be for that? Yeah, you know, that, you know a lot of times in my office, uh, that's the person, the mom or the grandmother, or the father's picked it up at the beach. So, you know, if you look at it, someone standing and their arms are at their side, you know, their hips should be even at the same level. The shoulder blades, you know, should be even. One shouldn't stick out more than the other. Your shoulders should be kind of level. You know, everyone's off a little bit, but one shoulder much higher or lower than the other. Uh, and what happens is with scoliosis, the spine kind of twists also. So when you lean forward, you know, if you're looking at someone's back, you'll see that elevation on one side. Uh, so you can have your child kind of lean over and just dangle their arms. Uh, and, and if one side looks higher than the other. But a lot of times, you know, in kids particularly, it's the hips looking uneven, you know, where the shoulder blade's sticking out. Uh, and, you know, uh, now what's interesting for a thin child, sometimes you'll look at the front and it'll look like the ribs in the front of the chest are sticking forward on the other side. And so my advice would be, you know, it's a lot of parents who say, you know, I noticed that last year, but I figured it wasn't any big deal. So I never mentioned it to the pediatrician. And we were so busy talking about the pneumonia that my child had that we never even got to that, right? Um, and so if a parent is concerned, it's absolutely something they can bring to their pediatrician's attention during their checkup visit. And it's the pediatrician is very skilled at checking out what's important and you know what is, what is normal and what's not normal. And, and speaking of the pediatrician, again, you know, your work as a team oftentimes uh, communicating back and forth about a patient. We uh, had some questions come in from a pediatrician about when to refer and when to monitor that. So uh, I've got a couple of situations, and, and Dr. Cruz, I'll start with you. Uh, I had a question about pectus. What is it, and, and when should uh, a pediatrician refer? When should they monitor it? 
Yeah, so uh, pectus, uh, that refers to basically where the, the breastbone, I'm trying to point in my chest, where the breastbone kind of caves in. And it can be very um, striking. Uh, so most of, you know, a lot of times uh, they can, can start out when they're a little bit younger, but then it can potentially, potentially get worse uh, as the child enters their adolescent growth spurt. But as they're rapidly growing, sometimes the, the pectus can get worse. You know, it's very rare that um, any surgical intervention needs to be done. Uh, surgery or a uh, surgery referral really is only for uh, patients who are starting to be symptomatic. Uh, meaning, so what happens? You know, the, the, the sternum kind of caves in and, and it starts pinching or impinging on vital structures like the heart and lungs. If the child has a pectus and they're playing sports and they're having shortness of breath or dizziness or any symptoms like that, okay, then that's when, that's when things uh, start to get a little bit concerning. That might be when. Uh, a referral to a surgical specialist might be appropriate. Great, great answer, thank you. And uh, another condition, uh, Dr. Schiller, you see quite a bit in towing. When is it a uh, concern? When should it be monitored and when should it be referred to, to someone like you? I mean, um, it's very common. Uh, uh, all three of us see this. Uh, we kind of expected it a lot of the time in the newborn uh, walker, you know, those, those early walkers, so to speak. Uh, they all tend to in-tow. Um, they'll do that up through maybe age two or three, and, and then, you know, they'll figure out where they're going to be. We, as I say to the, uh, some of the parents, if I stick them in the mall uh, for an hour, God forbid, and watch people walk, they'll have three columns with pigeon toe duck walkers and people that their feet are dead straight, and they'll probably have even numbers in each column. And so, you know, where our feet are positioned is sort of, uh, you know, there, there's flavors all around. And so it becomes an issue for us when they're at the extremes. So people that are extremely externally rotated or internally rotated that um, it affects their daily function. So they're either tripping over themselves or, for example, I had a patient that couldn't play the drums because his feet were so externally rotated he couldn't play the bass drum at the same time he was hitting the hi-hat. So I, I don't, you know, it's, it's really functional problems. When do we see it? We'll see it all the time, okay? Um, in essence, we'll always see it. Most of the time, um, when I say most, I mean almost always, it's nothing that we need to treat, either with braces or with special shoes or anything like that. I mean, that was the old way of teaching and Certainly when I was a resident and Dr. Everson was a resident, we had mentors that braced everything that involved in towing, out towing, crooked feet, straight feet that technically weren't club feet. So bottom line is that we tend not to have to do anything and just watch. Uh, but we always will see these children because a lot of the times parents just need to be reassured that everything is okay. And on the very rare occasion, we do find some kids that are in towing more so on one side than the other. And we pick up a random neuromuscular problem like cerebral palsy. It's, it's rare, uh, but that has happened. And so it's always good to sort of see the patient, just watch and just make sure. But most of the time, <clears throat> it's going to be totally fine. Great. And uh, Dr. Everson, uh, the same question to you about scoliosis, when to refer and when to monitor. Great question. I just want to just jump back really quickly to the pectus question. Uh, so Dr. Cruz talked about pex, pectus excavatum, which is where there's a hole. The other kind of pectus uh, is what people call a pigeon chest and where it sticks out forward. Uh, and there, there are brace treatments for that that can correct that. Uh, it's really important. So when the, ch when the pigeon chest sticks out, um, you know, the pediatric surgeons at Hasbro are the ones who manage that. There's a thoracic clinic. And so very important, if it looks like it's getting progressively worse while they're growing, there is a brace that can treat that. Uh, and so we don't treat that and we don't brace that. It often goes along with scoliosis uh, or, or what we call connective tissue disorders, which we do treat some part of that. But just that's one thing if someone is, is saying, well, it doesn't bother them, you know, once they're done growing, it's too late to treat it. So, so I would always, I would recommend, you know, any concern, uh, uh, thoracic surgery or pediatric surgery would manage that. Um, with respect to scoliosis, uh, you know, everyone has their own um, comfort level, and it really depends on a lot of things. You know, how old is the patient, whether the patient has symptoms, and even things like family history. You know, um, I just operated today on a girl who, you know, I did surgery on her sister 
uh, three years ago for the same same scoliosis. And you know, so so one sibling has it. We know scoliosis is genetic. So if mom has it, it runs in the family. Maybe have a higher index of suspicion. You know, the second thing is uh, is how close they are to done growing. You know, if a child has a curve that you can barely see from the outside, or a small curve, twenty degree curve, or something like that, and they're just about done growing, there's unlikely there's going to be a whole lot to worry about. On the other hand, any curve in a child under ten is is probably should be taken seriously, and so. In general, the normal rule of thumb is that for curves under 20, they can be observed and watched uh, and, and re-x-rayed. You know, and I, and I found we've done a study on this around here. The culture here is not really to do that in the pediatric uh, setting. You know, one of the things that we have at University of Orthopedics is a machine called the EOS machine, and it's the only one in, 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 uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, and one EOS x-ray is 1 30th the radiation of a regular x-ray. You get a front view, a side view. We can do three-dimensional reconstructions. We can go from the head to the toe. We can do just the legs. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. So, so we got that because, you know, there's a lot of concern about radiation. And so some pediatricians, you know, uh, will, will think, you know, someone has scoliosis and they'll, they'll want to get an x-ray. And the family might say, you know, I'm not really comfortable getting an x-ray because my child's very young and we're worried about cancer. Um, and so that, that's where the EOS machine can be very handy. So in general... You know, a skeletally immature, someone who's growing a lot, uh, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they should be sent over if, uh, uh, you know, if it looks like they have a significant curvature. Great. And, uh, Dr. Everson, you mentioned Hasbro and we did off the top. Can you explain the relationship uh, between University of Orthopedics and the Hasbro Ch Children's Hospital? Sure. Um, so, you know, we are the pediatric orthopedic department for Hasbro Children's Hospital. And, uh, What's different about a children's hospital uh, is that a lot of the care that we provide uh, is provided as a, as a care team that includes pediatric surgeons, urologists, GI doctors, anesthesiologists, and pediatric specialists. And so a lot of times, you know, I'll be sent patients by an orthopedist who says, you know, um, I, I can fix their surgical problem really easily, but they have a, a, this disease and, they, and their GI doctor is at Hasbro. We need a pediatric anesthesiologist and they're at Hasbro. Um, and so we feel like, you know, we're able to take care of the whole child because if it's out of our realm where, you know, we're fixing the orthopedic component of it and they need a neurosurgeon or they need someone else with a specialty, you know, so really we, we cover the emergency room for all trauma there. We do all of our operations there for the most part for our inpatient surgery and we consult there on inpatients and work with the doctors there very closely. Great. And on top of that, uh, Dr. Cruz, all surgeons and all faculty um, at University of Orthopedics are faculty at Brown University. Why was that important to you? And explain to, to folks uh, why that is an important part of your job. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think we all chose to work where we work uh, because we have an academic mission. You know, we're not just, we're not just orthopedic surgeons, we're not just physicians, we're also teachers. So uh, we love teaching. Um, you know, we teach the Brown orthopedic residents. We have a pediatric fellow. There, are, uh, we have Brown medical students that are teaching. I mean, there's, there's, there's every day in clinic, every day in the operating room, we have a learner uh, with us. And it just, it's, it's for, from, you know, if there's any teachers out there, you, you know, you can relate to how, how fulfilling it is to be able to. Um, you know, guide uh, a, a learner uh, through their learning experience. And, you know, it's not just that we're, uh, for, at least for me, I don't, I don't like to teach just for the sake of teaching, but, you know, they're, they're teaching me just as much as I'm teaching them, you know, uh, and they keep me on my toes and it really, it helps us uh, stay up to date with, uh, uh, with things that are changing, you know, medicine changes rapidly and we have to be really on our toes in order to make sure that we're uh, keeping up to date with everything that's, uh, new so that we're not, uh, you know, teaching our residents, uh, you know, 10-year-old uh, or 20-year-old techniques that are out of date. So uh, for all those reasons, um, it was very important, I think, for all of us to, uh, to, to, to take the job that, that we currently have. And, and same question, Dr. Schiller, for you about uh, <clears throat> the role of uh, teaching uh, younger surgeons. Um, well, you know, I, I do what I do because I like teaching. I, I spend most of my time um, in the office teaching with the rest of my partners. And uh, as far as you know, we're trying to guide. As you know, doc, you know, Dr. Cruz had said, and it, 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 we're trying to guide 
um, our, our residents and the medical students down a path that um, hopefully will make them better physicians, uh, not just surgeons, but physicians. We, take, we, we have pediatric medical students uh, in training, so to speak, going, to, going into pediatrics who take our rotation and really this is their last exposure to anything with musculoskeletal medicine. And I'll tell you, it's very fulfilling uh, to work with them and, and they seem to really enjoy uh, that rotation. Uh, and so that, you know, for us, it's, it's really just a chance to kind of impart something that we know and also learn a great deal about well, how we're doing as teachers as well as how, you know, we interact with different students and, and it's a lot different teaching now than say when I first got here 10 years ago and it certainly is a lot different teaching uh, and being part of the residency you know from when I first started almost 20 years ago so it's it's an evolution and we constantly Dr. Eberson will be to tell you know tell you since he's considered the old guard here uh, that even he's learned how to change his teaching style on the fly to really accommodate how new students are learning. And Dr. Everson, I'll, I'll ask you, program director, on top of everything you do, you really have an, an interest in, in the students here and the teaching. No, I do. And that's, uh, you know, I had some great teachers. And I think it's when you have a great teacher, it makes you want to give back. So, you know, I've been the, the residency program director uh, for about uh, I don't know, seven years now, six, seven years. Dr. Schiller kind of uh, helps as well. He's kind of the, our, our assistant director and, and, and it just is crucial and you know it's, it's because we love teaching uh, and uh, I, I think you know this year at Brown for example I think there's a record number of students from the medical school going into orthopedic surgery uh, which to us is you know it, it just hopefully means that we're modeling a uh, career as a physician that they want to emulate and, uh, and and it's interesting because on some level it's hard you know with kids bringing 15 people into the room you know every time we see patients uh, but they're so enthusiastic. Uh, I, it, the, the greatest thing is taking care of kids and they ask about, uh, you know, hey, where's Dr. So-and-so? Because they, they get so close with the residents. And I think that's a lesson they, that, that, that student doctor will take with them, you know, for every interaction they have in the future with, with, with patients. Great. And uh, again, uh, we're coming, uh, coming in on uh, almost an hour. So we'll ask any final questions for the viewers, please send them in, but uh, we'll kind of go around the horn here and, uh, some final thoughts uh, from you all on Dr. Cruz. We'll start with you on uh, what it is about taking care of kids that you, that you enjoy the most. Oh, that's a great question. So, so just a little history lesson. So, you know, in or we were, we all, we all call ourselves orthopedists. Okay. Orthopedics is a specialty uh, that we all you know, know and that we all entered, but you know, where does the word come from? So ortho means straight. Okay. Pedia is, uh, to, uh, is child. So really orthopedics is straight child. So re the orthopedics is, you know, when it was originally um, coined as a term was really was taking care of children. So at, at its core, orthopedics is taking care of children. So, and I think, um, you know, we do what we do because we, we just love taking care of kids. You know, they're just, they're, they're resilient. You know, all they, there's no secondary gain. I mean, they're, they're not in it for some weird reason. They're, they're in your office because they want to get better. You know, and uh, they're looking to you to help to help them get better. That's that's what we love. Um, and it's just, um, you know, kids are just innocent and they just they're great. So we we all all three of us I think enjoy uh, going to work every day, interacting with with the kids and the parents. And you know, I'll tell you, uh, I I love it when we're we're all three of us in the in the same uh, seeing patients at the same time because all you hear is just you know, laughs and jokes and and it's just it's just it's just a lot of fun. And I've heard that uh, Dr. Schiller will go to you next uh, about your, your favorite part about what you do. And I've heard you talk to those kids. You know how to talk to, to the kids and you talk to the parents. It's two different conversations. Uh, talk about that. And, and again, what your, your favorite part is. Um, well, I, you know, I live by the you're, you're only young once you can be immature forever. So it's really easy for me to uh, work with the children because uh, I've been accused worse at home. So um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I taught preschool and kindergarten before I went to medical school, so it's a little easy for me to regress uh, to that stage. But I, I do this because I genuinely like working with kids. They're fun. Uh, the parents, 
as I've said, and Dr. Everson, and Dr. Cruz will both agree, in general, we, um, we see the kids, but we treat the parents. That's really what we do. The parents, as you know, all of us here in this panel, in this panel all have children uh, with varying ages. And, um, you know, parent, you know, my, my wife is a mama bear, and uh, I have to learn how to t talk to her. And we know all parents want to be spoken to as their child. And so uh, it, it's an art form, and sometimes I win and sometimes I lose. But in general, uh, I do this because I, I like working with kids. I do like working with parents. Uh, they challenge me sometimes. But in the end, I do this, the, the changes and the impact we have on these kids now potentially has a long-term lasting impact, both physically and mentally. And that to me is the most gratifying, that the change we can make in them now will benefit them in the long term. Uh, at least that's my hope. And uh, that's what gets me up and, and gets me to work to work with these kids. A lot of great stuff, Dr. Everson. There's not left much left for you. They really uh, had some great comments, but tell us what, what is it that uh, brings you back every day and looks forward to, to the next? Well, you know, it's uh, kids just just energize you, and and uh, you know, I hear from a parent that you know, oh, you know, you're his favorite doctor. It's because all we do is goof around. You know, I don't give them any shots. You know, uh, uh, and you know, particularly when my kids were younger, you know, it's great when I knew the names of all the different Power Rangers, and I know who Chase is and who's Rubble, and uh, and and if you can have fun, I mean, it's a really really serious thing. The parents are there for some silly problem that you know is is nothing, but to them. They're picturing a lifelong disability for their child, and you know that they're going to outgrow it and be fine. So to be able to put someone at ease and just watch the air just, and everyone relax, you know, we always say, you know, the patients that are the most grateful are the ones that you said, oh, this is normal. It's going to be better, and it is. You've done nothing. Nature, you know, has fixed everything. But it's just that you're taking that burden off of their shoulders. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, how do you, how do you not have a great day when you're, when you're with your kids all day? I mean, how do you not have a great time? So it really is, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to be a pediatrician. I had a great pediatrician, and, but I like operating. So I married a pediatrician and decided just to be a surgeon. So I really have the best of all worlds. Well, uh, we see the reviews and the compliments online. You are all appreciated very much by your patient base and their families. And I've gotten to meet a lot of them. So, um, they're very lucky to have you. And uh, thank you all for the, the time tonight. There was some great useful information out there. And if we didn't get to any questions and you have some offline, certainly send them in or contact any of these great doctors directly. Um, we'll post this video. If you missed any of it, we'll post it on YouTube as well. So um, thanks again, guys, for your time tonight. And uh, we hope everyone stays safe and gets outside and plays. Thank thanks, you. guys. No problem. Have a great night. night. Thanks. Have a good night.